Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, in these lectures, I am um, going to talk about um, this project, um, which we started with uh, Michael Fadows more or less 10 years ago. Um, very nicely, you can actually find the traces of this on the internet. So in particular, you can find um, some pictures taken by some Japanese colleagues from a conference um, nine years ago now in um, Kyoto, where I was giving a talk with the same title. And um, most of what I'm going to talk about today is, is something which uh, we knew back then. So that's going to be my, the first talk, is trying to give you a, um, a background talk, trying to give some cultural comments, maybe some little introductions to the three subjects in the title, mirror symmetry, Legland's unity, and the aging system, and at the end, try to indicate the work we had, we, we did with Michael Tadeus, which uh, indicated how these three fields might come together, or will come together, in a mirror symmetry conjecture for um, kitchen systems, for Legland's your groups. So let me start with um, discussing the, uh, the first subject in the title, mirror symmetry, or just maybe giving you a, um, um, an overview of the early history of the subject. Um, so it was not a well-defined moment when we can talk about mirror symmetry appearing in the string theory literature. It was in the late 80s, various forms, various ideas were converging together. And then it was in the early 90s, in the work of Condell's et al., where mathematical predictions have uh, been made, which are really where we mathematicians can relate to the subject. It was, of course, giving some spectacular uh, formulas for the number of rational curves in certain cardinal threefolds. So just to have a, a general idea about what um, this mirror symmetry is about, mathematically speaking, it relates the symplectic geometry of a Calabian manifold uh, in, say, a d-dimensional Calabian manifold with the um, complex geometry of its mirror Calabian manifold. So the idea is that this Calabian manifold should come in pairs. To this, you should have the mirror partner to any given one, and um, the symplectic geometry of one should be somehow um, associated with the complex geometry of the other. I mean, in mathematics, we love these kind of dictionaries because things which you might know in, in this story, maybe the complex geometry was better known, which you know in complex geometry should have some image in the symplectic geometry, which was a much lesser known subject. Just in order to, um, the, to see that um, we, we remember all these definitions, so a Calabian manifold, roughly speaking, or it is actually just a Keeler manifold together with a holomorphic volume form. So Keeler geometry means really just a complex projective geometry if you are an algebraic geometer, and the Keeler structure has inside it a symplectic structure in one hand and a complex structure in the other. And the mirror symmetry is this uh, fascinating conjecture which says somehow that the complex geometry side of one Calabian should be seen in the, in the symplectic geometry of the mirror. So the first aspect, and pretty much the only aspect I'm going to attempt in trying to understand this um, in, in some given example, is going to be comparing the Hodge numbers of the two. Calabian manifold. So that's the first aspect is what we call the topological mirror test. Uh, if you have the pair of Calabians, then this uh, surprising identity of, uh, of their Hodge numbers, agreement of Hodge numbers should take place. The point is that one Hodge number should appear 
on the other side, but somehow it has somewhat transformed uh, indices. Um, again, just a reminder for any compact killer manifold or smooth projective variety, we have this Hodge decomposition of the cohomology, which gives us these Hodge spaces of type PQ, and then the dimension of those Hodge spaces will give us these Hodge numbers. So the Hodge numbers are somehow the first topological invariants of uh, killer manifolds one can try to think about. And for Calabiaus, it is mirror symmetric Calabiaus, the first observation is that they are related in some peculiar way. Okay, so we are going to consider examples of Calabiaus which are more special. They are so-called hyper-killer manifolds. And for compact ones, we have already this symmetry inbuilt in the Hodge numbers. So it's a single compact hyperkiller manifold we are talking about, and then its Hodge numbers satisfy this symmetry. Um, so for Hodge, uh, if you have now a mirror symmetric pair of um, compact hyperkiller manifolds, then this identity together with this one will only say that the Hodge numbers agree, maybe without any shift of the indices. So this somehow is going to be an important aspect of what I'm going to talk about, but for some fake reasons, as we will see. So again, let me just say that a hyperkiller manifold is a, is a special kind of Calabian manifold. It is a killer manifold, and it also has a holomorphic volume form, but it has something more refined. It is going to have a, um, a constant, um, a constant um, holomorphic symplectic form on it, and of course the holomorphic symplectic form, which is this um, degree to non-degenerate 2 form, in the right power of this is going to give us this volume form. So hyperkiller manifold, just roughly speaking, is a, is a special kind of Calabiao manifold, which has on the top of being Calabiao a holomorphic symplectic structure. Okay, so um, to continue with the history of uh, mirror symmetry on the mathematical side, um, now comes, of course, the famous suggestion of Konsevich, how somehow conceptually to think about the agreement of these two aspects of uh, Calabian's, of uh, Calabian manifolds for, for mirror, mirror symmetric Calabian manifolds. So he, what he does, he says that we must be able to um, associate certain categories to on the one hand, the complex geometry of one Calabiao, and this is something mathematicians have been um, familiar with, the um, derived category of current sheaves on, on this complex manifold Y. And on the other side, Konsevich was suggesting that we should be able to construct a category, the so-called Fukaya category of the symplectic manifold, which is defined only using the symplectic structure. And then the idea was that the physics really is reflecting what it's reflecting is an equivalence like this. But back then, of course, we didn't have this construction for the Foucault category, and 16 years later, we have some candidates now, and in fact, one of the driving motivations to the construction of these Foucault categories was exactly this homological neurosymmetric conjecture. I'm really just mentioning this to say that there is a mathematical formulation now of mirror symmetry. We are going to concentrate on less um, involved um, versions of this. Um, but one particular aspect of the history is going to be interesting for us because until this construction of Strominger, Yao, Zaslo, this geometrical construction, we didn't have a conceptual way to understand how the mirror symmetric Calabia arises from a given Calabia. And that was changed by the suggestion of Strominger, Yao, Zaslo, who gave us a way to think about the mechanism, how given a Calabiao, we can construct its uh, mirror one. And so, roughly speaking, what they were suggesting is a geometrical picture which connected the, uh, the two uh, Calabiao. So the geometrical picture was um, um, a map from both Calabiaos to the same base. Typically, the base, you should think, is a sphere of real dimension the same as the complex dimension of the Calabiao. So originally it was a three-sphere. Um, these two vibrations are very special. They are called special Lagrangian vibrations. And then the connection between the two vibrations should be the, the generic fibers 
in both of the cases are Torai, and the Torai somehow should be dual Torai. So that was the, the geometrical connection between the two, and provided you can construct such dual special energy vibrations between the two mirror symmetric color vials, then you can now think about the mirror as being uh, the moduli space of certain um, objects. In physics, they are called certain brains, D brains, which uh, on the genetic fibers are just human local systems. And uh, on the genetic fiber being a torus, human systems on it is going to give you exactly the dual torus. And that was somehow the idea that there must be a geometric connection between the two mirror symmetric columns. But even today, this uh, construction uh, is, hasn't been really fully uh, proved to exist between two compact columns, three folds. But we will see that in a different world, for example, the hyperkiller world, and uh, so we will not have compact ones, but we will have non compact hyperkiller manifolds, there will be an instance when this picture of Strominger of Zaslow is somehow automatically going to be satisfied. And that's going to be the starting point of our observations. So, well, let me close this um, historical digression about mirror symmetry by saying that um, mirror symmetry, uh, besides these uh, aspects, is much uh, richer. There have been many predictions, and many of them have been proved in the mathematical literature. Still, somehow, we still lack a general understanding of the procedure. Now we might be able to talk about the Foucault category, but it's still far from deducing anything like Conservative's homological mirror symmetry. So this is still a field after 16 or 20 years since, since its inception, which is still exciting and, and a lot of work has been done on it. Okay, let me also finish maybe mirror symmetry. I have to say, maybe show you some pictures of these Hodge diamonds, because somehow this idea of topological mirror symmetry is going to be so crucial of what's going to happen. So let me show you the picture of the Hodge diamond of one of the first Calabio three folds, which was studied, the um, Fermat Fintic, which is a hypersurface in P4 given by a Fermat-like equation. Um, the Hodge diamond looks like this. So again, remember that these Hodge diamonds are, the Hodge numbers are dimensions of spaces in the decomposition of the cohomology of the variety. So here you see a one dimension H0, the space is connected. Here you see no Hodge numbers because it's a simply connected manifold. Here you see a one dimensional H2. And then suddenly you will see a huge H3 with a weird decomposition of its Hodge numbers. So, and etc. So this is the uh, Hodge diamond of, um, of the Fermat Vinti. And then you can think what its, um, its um, mirror should be, and the physicists in the very early days uh, suggested that the mirror should be, in fact, for them it was just an orbifold quotient of our, uh, uh, of our Columbiao manifold by some finite group. And the physicists somehow could think of the uh, orbifold um, sharing the same kind of topological and geometrical structure as, as a smooth variety for mathematicians, they in particular had a definition of what their Hodge numbers should be. For mathematicians, in fact, it was preferable to work with the so-called Crapon resolution of the um, of the of this orbifold. And the Crapon resolution is just another Calabia O3 fold which resolves the singularities, but the, which this one is now non-singular. And this happens to have a Crapon resolution. So mathematicians prefer to work with the Crapon resolution in the place of the orbifold. At any rate, you can take the Hodge numbers either of the orbifold in the physics in the physicist way uh, or the Hodge numbers of the uh, the resolution. Then you are going to get a Hodge diamond which is reflected along this axis here. So it's kind of pretty funny from a mathematical point of view having classes living in H3 going some going down to H2 here and some going up to H4, some going uh, to um, to H, H6 and so on to H0. So it is kind of very funny from the mathematics perspective. Let me now show you the same diagram you have seen in my talk in, um, in, um, in Kyoto, which is, is somehow at that time is a crucial way of explaining one fact that why we are seeing the agreement of Hodge numbers and no symmetry 
whatsoever. In the case of a compact hyperkiller manifold, we do have this inbuilt symmetry I mentioned. The Hodge diamond is symmetric along the same axis already. So if you flip it, you are going to still get the same Hodge diamond. So the mirror, which is supposed to be another K3 surface, you will, of course, have the same Hodge diamond. But this is what's expected. Okay, so that concludes the kind of um, general ideas about mirror symmetry we are going to be using in later of the talk. And then now I will change the subject and go to the, to the second aspect, which may be, at least for me, it was the, um, the hardest to try to understand. So I am in the process of learning of what exactly these things are. It's a very deep and very wide area of ideas. But roughly speaking, I will give you a rough picture of what um, this uh, Lagrange correspondence is doing as far as we, we need them to understand the motivations uh, which will come from, from these ideas. So, what uh, I mean, very simply saying, what uh, the Lagrange program is doing is trying to describe the uh, absolute color group of the rational number. In other words, what it tries to do, it tries to understand all the finite extension of the rationals that somehow has enormous amount of number theoretical information, this big group. So it would be amazing to be able to completely describe it. And then Lagon's idea was that instead of describing the group, let's try to describe its representations, finite dimensional complex representations, and uh, by some Tanakian argument that would somehow recover the group. So the idea was to um, understand representations in complex representations, in other words, to understand uh, homomorphisms from the group to GLN. So later, Lagrange understood that somehow there's um, some um, important um, aspects of the theory can be seen much better if you take other kind of reductive groups, not just GLN. And this is the whole theory now, takes a, a general reductive group for complex geometers, the reductive group is nothing but the complexification of a compact Lie group. So if you are complex geometer as I um, am, then you just take a compact Lie group, complexify it, and that's going to be your reductive group. And then there is some um, root datum you can attach to uh, any reductive group, which somehow classifies them. You, take, you can take the dual root datum, which is some combinatorial data, and that's going to uh, correspond to another reductive group and that's going to be its Lagrange dual. Okay, so the bonds which we will uh, be using or we will be studying in these lectures are very simple. GLN, I already mentioned, is somehow is cell dual, so that's why some aspect of Lagrange uh, philosophy doesn't, is not clear if you only study GLN. And then you have the pair of SLN and PGLN, this pair of Lagrange dual groups which will appear for us. Okay, so let me uh, then just very roughly speaking say what the Legland's uh, program or the conjectures is about. It's a, some sort of uh, correspondence between two sets of objects, certain representations, homomorphisms of the absolute Gala group into a or complex reductive group, and certain so called automorphic representations uh, of the dual group over some big analytic ring of the rational numbers. So this is some really difficult, analytically non-trivial representation theory which happens over this side. So it's hard to understand. But the idea is, was that somehow structures here will have some, um, some corresponding things on the other side. So why was, of course, Lagrange doing this in the first place? Because what he was doing was studying the, the Abelian case, the GL1 case turns out to be just class field theory. So if you think about GL1 representations, one-dimensional representations of any group, it's just uh, about the abelianization of the group. You really are understanding the abelianization of the group. And what it really does, um, homomorphisms to GL1, you can understand uh, the, um, the finite abelian extensions of the rational numbers. And that's what class field theory does. And uh, there was, in Tate's view of class field theory, there were objects on the other side which characterized these uh, abelian extension, finite abelian extensions of the rational numbers, which uh, then could have been generalized to these automorphic representations on the other side. And then, in order to show that these things are 
highly non-trivial for high other groups. Let me just mention that in the next non-trivial level is say GL2, you take your group, then basically this Lagrange philosophy is nothing but the famous Shimura Taniyama Bell theorem now, which says, which is somehow talks about different looking things on the right hand side though, in, the, in this case, automorphic representations can be related to modular forms, and in the left side, given an elliptic curve, you can take, um, or defined over the rational numbers, you can take the absolute Galois group acting on its first homology, which is two-dimensional, and you will get a two-dimensional representation of the absolute Galois group, and somehow the famous Shimura Tani Obeya conjecture can be taken as a version of the Lagrange philosophy for GL2. Then now uh, you might be able to appreciate that for higher groups we are still far away, but it's a very deep and uh, interconnected uh, set of conjectures. So what is going to be interesting for us and important for us that there is a version of the Leglands, uh, of the Leglands philosophy, the Leglands program, or a much more geometrical setup, which is going to be close related to our considerations. And that's um, in the so-called function field version of the um, Leglands program. So here, what you start with is then in the place of uh, rational numbers or in more general finite extension of the rational numbers, which is a number field. Um, the analog of that somehow in this uh, analogy is, um, is the function field of a curve, of a complex one-dimensional curve uh, over a finite field. So there are some deep connections between these fields and the number theorists have used this uh, analogy to, um, to formulate number theoretical results, algebraic number theoretical results or conjectures or ideas over the rationals you know, for the function field. And then they got something geometrical which they could use the algebraic geometry of the curve to prove. Of course, the most famous example of this is the uh, analog of the uh, Riemann hypothesis for the Riemann zeta function. The analog of this is the zeta function of the curve and the Riemann hypothesis for that zeta function had been proven by Weyl in his famous work, I think in the 40s, already using algebraic geometry. So this is one instance when the uh, function field version turns out to be much easier than the original number field version. But there is another instance of this analogy which is more recent and more interesting for us, uh, because what Engo in his recent work studying the same kind of algebraic geometry we are going to study, namely the Hitchin system, we managed to prove geometrically the function field analog of the so-called fundamental lemma. But in his case, he was also lucky because he actually was known to imply the fundamental lemma in the number theoretic case for number fields. So sometimes you know that the two results are equivalent or you can prove they are equivalent like in this case and sometimes like in the Riemann hypothesis, it's still not clear what's the um, analog of the, um, of the proof for, for over the rational numbers. So we will mention Engel's work in the very end too, because it's also related to the agent system and it turns out to be very close related to our considerations. So there is one more version of the Legnitz program, which somehow is important for our perspective because we are actually going to work not with curves over finite fields, but we will work with curves over the complex numbers, that is, with Riemann surfaces in these lectures. And then now the analogies are going to be weakened, so it's not going to be that strong. Still, you can formulate a, a version of the Legland's correspondence in the case of a Riemann surface, and this is due to the Mohn and uh, Bailinson and Dreamfeld, and this is called the geometric Legland's conjecture. Roughly speaking again, um, there is a complex geometrical analog of the idea of a representation of the absolute Galois group. So the absolute Galois group somehow will be analogous to the fundamental group of the Riemann surface, and the representations of the fundamental group will be uh, certain local system, geolocal systems on the Riemann surface. And on the other side of this correspondence, you will see some objects which have some of these uh, um, names, hacky island sheaves on, on certain moduli space of GL bottles on the, on the other side. 
So we will see that uh, there is going to be a geometrical mechanism to use this kind of um, conjectures which will relate to our mirror symmetry in a moment. In fact, our kind of mirror symmetry was uh, also noticed from a completely physical approach to uh, the geometric Leblanc program, namely Kapustin Witten, recently 2006, um, managed to get this uh, picture of the geometric Leblanc conjecture from completely physical considerations. What they were arguing is that a certain s duality phenomenon, which is roughly similar to the kind of duality theories we have been, about what I have mentioned so far, um, so this is a non-abelian generalization of electromagnetic duality, this is duality, um, in a very particular physical theory, supersymmetric young theory in four dimensions. Um, anyway, so they used their physical uh, ideas, and then what they found is that, um, that somehow this as duality reduced to two dimensions is going to give us, should give us exactly the Konsevich's homological mirror symmetry for the um, Leibniz dual Hitchin systems, the ones we are going to study in a moment. And then that um, homological mirror symmetry somehow should be nothing else but this geometric Leibniz conjecture. Anyway, so this was, um, then this concludes um, the overview of the ideas around the uh, Leibniz duality, which somehow has something to do with the project uh, we will see. And then the last ingredient, and then as a geometer, it's the most important part of the ingredient is the Hitchin system. So first I'm going to, um, to explain um, one particular aspect of the Hitchin system, namely that it is a completely integrable Hamiltonian system, just to see what the completely integrable Hamiltonian system is, and um, from that geometry how things like this tori uh, arising, exactly the ones which appear in Stolling area of Zaslo, and, um, and then we will get started when we are there. So first I will talk about a little bit about um, how to think about completely integrable Hamiltonian systems. Um, so in general, and this is a very rough uh, set of ideas, but it has very nice mathematical formulation. So in Hamiltonian mechanics, you think of uh, your um, physical system as given by the phase space of the system, which is uh, just a symplectic manifold some even dimensional manifold together with a symplectic form closed uh, and non-degenerate uh, two form. Then using this um, symplectic structure, we can do the physics. So the idea is that we will have, we are going to be given a Hamiltonian function, which should be the um, energy function of the system. And then um, in order to understand the dynamics of the, uh, the classical mechanical system, we will construct a vector field, the so-called Hamiltonian vector field using the function, and in fact it is done in a very straightforward manner using the symplectic two form. There is a unique vector field which satisfies that the exterior derivative of the function, this one form, is going to be exactly this one form which you get by plugging in the vector field into uh, the symplectic form. So this gives, a this gives us a vector field, and if you are given a vector field, you can try to integrate the vector field, meaning you want to find the one-parameter group of diffeomorphisms of the manifold, which will uh, be integrating the vector field. And that flow is what we are after in Hamiltonian mechanics. The flow is going to be the motion of the system. So the idea is, the question in Hamiltonian mechanics, can you integrate the Hamiltonian vector field? And we will see that in one particular example, in the case of a completely integrable Hamiltonian system, there will be a conceptually very nice way to integrate the Hamiltonian vector field. So what is this um, integrable system? The first notion we need to um, know is the first integral of um, the system. So first integral is easy. It's any function which is uh, a conserved quantity, a function which is invariant under the flow, in other words, a function with which if you derivate this with the Hamiltonian vector field, you get zero. The nice thing about this is that if you take the definition of the Hamiltonian vector field, you know, like this, then you can find that this derivative is going to be this very nice symmetric uh, uh, formula for, for um, taking, when, when you take the Hamiltonian vector field associated with the function f. 
So it's a sym symmetric quantity. You may even actually say that the functions are in involution, the Poisson commute, if, uh, if one is the first integral for the other. And now, we will say that the Hamiltonian system is completely integrable if we have as many first integrals in involution as possible. So, as many means that as many as half of the dimension of the symplectic manifold D. So, we will have D uh, generic, generically linearly independent functions. In other words, this combined map is going to be, submer going to be submersion uh, generically. And also, what we want is that they are pervising in motion. Not just that they are all first integrals with respect to the Hamiltonian functions, but they are pervise commuting. So that's when we are going to call the Hamiltonian system completely integrable if we can find the maximum number of commuting, pervise commuting, uh, Poisson commuting functions on it. Okay, why do we like this if we are really just interested in trying to integrate the Hamiltonian vector field? We like this because now, on a generic fiber at least, we will have uh, a nice uh, action of um, the additive group of the vector space RD generated by these vector fields. The point is that they are all going to give you an unprimitive group of diffeomorphisms on that fiber, the action is going to be along the fiber, and because they pass some commute the functions, these vector fields will commute, so the action they generate is going to be an abelian action. So basically this additive group is going to act on the generic fiber, you are going to see a nice effective action of this uh, additive vector space, you will get an affine structure on the generic fiber of a completely integrable Hamiltonian system. And so if now you want to know the flow of any given one, you just take that linear line inside this affine structure. So it gives you a nice conceptual way to integrate the, the vector uh, field, original vector field, if you can find um, this uh, completely integrable system. So for us, what is going to be interesting that we will have a function uh, a completely integrable Hamiltonian system which is proper. And if it is proper, then the generic fiber is going to be having this affine structure of this section of the vector space, and so that will mean that the generic fiber will become a torus. So that's uh, uh, maybe the, the moral for this uh, general story, that if you have a proper completely integrable system, the generic fiber is a nice torus. Um, just to see that these things actually are interesting for, from the classical mechanical perspective, uh, several um, completely integrable systems are actually have been classically known, the Euler and Kovalevskaya talks and also uh, the spherical pendulum. Okay, so we are going to take the Higgin system, which is a complex algebraic version of these integrable systems. I already mentioned that uh, if you have a hypercular manifold, it has a holomorphic symplectic structure, and the total space of the agent system is going to be complex symplectic, this hypercular manifold, and we will be doing exactly the same story here, but replacing the real reals with the complex numbers, and in the place of a real symplectic manifold, we will take a complex symplectic manifold, where the complex, the symplectic formula is going to be holomorphic, uh, non-degenerate, close to form, and then the same story we can play and then we can talk about um, what we call algebraic integrable systems, completely integrable algebraic Hamiltonian integrable systems. And they are the same as for the reals, except that now everything is a complex manifold together with a complex symplectic structure. We have holomorphic functions or algebraic functions on it, which are in a pairwise involution. And then what happens is that most of the known examples actually can now be interpreted as a version of this Hitchin system. So somehow it becomes uh, this idea of Hitchin, which I will explain in some cases uh, of constructing an integrable system, seems to be very universal. So most of, many of the uh, known completely integrable algebraic Hamiltonian systems are examples of the Hitchin system. So they are associated to a complex curve C. That's how we are going to start with a complex curve C and the complex reductive loop G. For us, we will only take these three groups I already mentioned. And then in order to place the Hitchin system in perspective, I have to say 
because it actually arose in the study of some um, equations in mathematical physics, namely the Young-Mills equation. So Hitchin was studying the four-dimensional Young-Mills equations reduced to two dimensions, and then he found that the equations uh, uh, reduced to the so-called self-duality equations, and then the total space of the solutions of the self-duality equations on the Riemann surface turns out to be the total space of an integrable system. Okay, so let me now be a little bit more concrete, in fact more concrete, and explain the case of GLN, SLN, and PGLN, what is the Hitchin integrable system. So first let's start with um, defining the total space of the Hitchin system for GLN. So again, we want to see a holomorphic symplectic uh, manifold, a smooth complex manifold with a holomorphic symplectic structure, so it is going to be the moduli space of certain Higgs bundles on the Riemann surface. So Higgs bundle is, look, may look like a frightening notion, but in fact this is somehow the natural idea of a matrix somehow defined globally over a Riemann surface. So the Higgs bundle, you really, really we should take the point of view, it's nothing, it's just somehow the right notion of a matrix over a Riemann surface. So what is it then? So let, let me give you the definition over a smooth projective complex um, genus G curve, um, if you say that uh, a pair E phi is a degree D G and Higgs bundle with the following uh, is um, satisfied. So first of all, we want to take a matrix, but the matrix of course is going to be homomorphism from a vector space to itself. So the first thing is to think what's the global idea of a vector space over, oops, over the Riemann surface, and of course it's a vector bundle. So the first part of the definition of a Higgs bundle is the vector bundle where the matrix is going to operate. So for us, we will take a rank n vector bundle because we have a GLN, and for some technical reasons, we will fix the degree of the vector bundle to be some d, and we will later want d to be co prime to n. And then the phi is going to be the matrix, the, the Higgs field, the so-called Higgs field. It is, uh, by definition, a um, section of the endomorphism bundle of the vector bundle uh, times the canonical bundle. So if you really just wanted to take a matrix, then you would have taken um, a section of the endomorphism bundle. But again, for some technical reason, it's much better to twist this and then somehow take uh, a section of, uh, of the same model tensor with the canonical model. It's actually a very nice notion if you think about like this. Locally, a Higgs field is going to be a matrix because endomorphism of E is going to trivialize. As a trivial model, endomorphism of E is just going to be matrices, but the entries of the matrix are going to be one forms on the curve. So it's, it's just the matrix locally, uh, with the values being one forms on the curve. Okay, so now you can take the space of all of such uh, pairs. Um, you, may, you remember I mentioned that Nigel, that Hitchin uh, studied uh, the these young mills equations, or somehow reduced the two dimensions, and then the solution to the self duality equation will be in one to one correspondence exactly with the stable. GLN Higgs bundle, which is some very natural idea of uh, talking about stable Higgs bundles in algebraic geometry. And so the moduli space of all such stable Higgs bundles up to, up to isomorphism is going to be a nice space, and some of that will be thought of to be the space of solutions of these um, self duality equations reduced to two dimensions. So what's going to be important for us is that this space is not singular. And then somehow, because of the, the young mills equations, the origin of the variety, it will carry a very natural, very nice metric, a hyperkiller metric. So in particular, it's going to have a natural holomorphic symplectic two-form on it. So it's a space which we now define in algebraic geometry, and so it is a complex structure, and with respect to this complex structure, it will have a natural holomorphic symplectic two-form on it. Okay, so that uh, is one of the spaces which we will consider in these lectures. Um, the other one, other two in today's talk will be the 
examples of aging systems or the total space of aging system for SLN and PGLN, and this is very analogous to the GLN case. So very uh, quickly, let's go through uh, what, how you have to modify the idea of a GLN Higgs bundle to get an SLN Higgs bundle, and how do you get the PGLN Higgs moduli space. Okay, so SLN, of course, is just the subgroup of GLN where the uh, determinant is 1. So what we will be saying now that we have an SLN Higgs bundle. For technical reasons, again, we will be talking about lambda twisted uh, Higgs bundles, where lambda is a line bundle of degree d on the curve c. And then a lambda twisted SLN Higgs bundle, again, is going to be a pair of a vector bundle together with the Higgs field. Um, you will have again a rank n vector bundle where the determinant bundle is going to be this fixed line bundle. Um, you will have this matrix, the Higgs field, but now it has to be an SLN Higgs field somehow in the Lie algebra of SLN. It's just the trace free matrices. So correspondingly, we will be taking only Higgs fields which are trace free. So again, if you just think of locally, you have this matrix of one forms, and then the sum of the diagonal at one forms should be zero. So that's what an SLN Higgs field is. And then again, you can form by some GIT Gaussian construction, if you like, the moduli space of stable SLN Higgs bundles. This is going to be another example of a non singular and uh, hyperkähler variety, the ones we will like. Okay, and then finally we have to talk about the PGLN space and it's a little bit tricky and the easiest way to go is to notice that uh, um, PGLN arises from GLN uh, by quotient of uh, the center and also there is some peculiar connection between SLN. Uh, yeah, well we will see that what we have is that on the SLN variety they have an action of a finite group. Okay, so then, then what is this finite group? This is going to be crucial. This finite group is going to give us these all defaults, which are we already seen for a mirror symmetric Calabian. So the finite group is the uh, group of n torsion points on the Jacobian of the curve that is order and line bundles. So if you have an order and line bundle, you can tensor the S and Higgs bundle by that, and then it's not going to change the determinant because if you tensor with the line bundle, the determinant is going to change with the nth power of that line bundle. So if it was an n torsion point, then it's not going to change the determinant bundle, and then it does not touch, touch the, um, the Higgs field either, because of course the endomorphism bundle of E and the E tensor L will, is going to be the same. So this gamma is naturally going to act on the moduli space of stable sub such objects. Stability is not going to change either, so you have this finite group, which is an abstract group, is just Zn to the 2G. And this finite group is going to act on this non-singular space. And the quotient of this is going to be, this or default quotient is the space we are going to be the twist, we are going to call the twisted PGLN uh, Higgs moduli space. So this, by construction, is naturally an or default. It will have some or default singularities. And this is going to be your choice for the PGL and x space. Okay, so that um, concludes the so discussion. In yes. the SLN case, stability condition is uh, taken among the sub-objects with the same uh, determinant? Exactly. Okay. So the only constraint is the trace-free, the five is trace-free. Right. Yeah, what is right? You take the determinant condition in addition or just the trace-free piece? Um, Well, it's, it must be the same as for GLN, so a priori I wouldn't GLN, take it. Uh, you don't have any data. I know, I know. But it's, a sub, it's, a, it's exactly the intersection of the, of the degree lambda uh, bundles inside the GLN. That's why I'm asking, because it's... Yeah, yeah I see. Um, but you see, you have an action of, um, of line bundles. You can always tensor, so you can go from... Um, of any degree D bundle, you can go to lambda. So if you have a destabilizing bundle of any determinant, you can tensor with the line bundle, which is a, a, some, some root of that line bundle. So you can actually, it's, it's equivalent. You can take either way. <coughs> okay, we can talk about that maybe afterwards. Okay, 
So, so this defines the total space of the agent system, the moduli space of Higgs bundles. And, um, and then let me now define the Higgs system itself. So as Higgs bundles we thought of as being the matrices, the globally defined matrices over the Riemann surface, the Higgs system is going to be something again simple uh, coming from linear algebra, namely the Higgs system is just going to be the characteristic polynomial of that matrix. So we are going to do this globally somehow over the Riemann surface and that's going to be the Higgs system. So the idea is this, you take the moduli space of Higgs bundles, say GL and stable Higgs bundles, you have a pair of a vector bundle in the Higgs field, and then you think of the Higgs field again locally as a matrix of one forms on the curve, and then you just take the characteristic polynomial of that matrix of one forms. So in particular, you will see that the trace is going to be a one form, so the trace naturally is going to be a section of the chemical bundle, and for example, the determinant is going to be a section of the nth power of the canonical bundle and all the other coefficients of the, uh, of the um, characteristic polynomial is going to be some section of as uh, appropriate power of the canonical bundle. So, um, so that's um, the definition of the HM map. You take the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field and the coefficients are going to give you an element in this vector space. For SLN, you do exactly the same thing. You take the characteristic polynomial, but you there artificially restricted yourself to the trace field case anyway, so the trace is going to be zero, and so the base of the aging map is going to be reduced to starting at the second power of the canonical bundle, going up to one, the nth power. And then if you, again, do this tensoring with the order and line bundle, then um, that's not going to change the Higgs field, so you are going to have the finite group acting along the fibers of the Higgs map for SLM, and uh, this way you will have a Higgs map um, restricted to the quotient with the same base. So that's the PGLN Higgs map. Okay, so now comes this major result which really starts things putting in motion. So the first part of this says Nigel Higgs uh, first theorem which says that these uh, maps from a symplectic manifold, these are everything is now holomorphic symplectic manifold because they are hyperkiller, down to this affine space or vector space is a completely integrable algebraic Hamiltonian system. So if you really want to see things completely explicitly and you want to take coordinate functions of this vector space and then the content of Hitchens result is two, it has two parts. First, that these functions plus some commute, they are in involution. And the second part is that you have as many as possible, that is the dimension of the base of the agent system is half of the dimension of the total space. So, yes. Right, so you, this is a vector space you have here. You, you can just take, say, the coordinate functions on them. You will have as many as the dimension. And then if you want to take those particular, then they will be in, in, uh, in motion. In fact, any two functions on the base space are going to be in motion. So, but if you really want to see everything exactly the same way as we've seen, then you just want to take these functions. Yeah. But you're saying that for chi, that's a completely integrable system. And for chi, yeah, that's a different completely integrable system. For yeah. different cat, that's another completely integral. Yeah, they are different base, total spaces, and uh, the base in the, these two cases will be the same, but uh, they are different uh, total spaces, yes. Okay, and, and now comes the other part of this uh, observation, and this other part is that, at least in the cases we are going to consider, when N and D are co-prime, then you have a nice, completely integrable Hamiltonian system with total space, which is a non singular symplectic variety, which is additionally proper. So it had been proved by Nigel for SL2 and GL2, and then it's Uriah for GLN and for things for any, any reductive group. So you have these nice, proper, completely integrable Hamiltonian systems. And then now, of course, generically, that you expect to see this tori arising, but we are in this complex algebraic world, and all tori are going to be 
topological tori, but they will also have a structure of an algebraic variety. So you will see a billion varieties appearing as the generic fibers of these of these hitching maps. And this is the starting point of the project that we compared with Michael Fadel's the um, generic fibers of the SLN and PGLN hitching maps. So the setup is this. So, uh, so um, this has all been done in the context of homomorphic symplectic map. Right. So the, 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 the torus that is acting on the fibers is in fact a, a complex torus, not a real torus, right? You have homomorphic vector fields? Right? Yes, you have homomorphic vector fields. So, uh, I mean, what is the statement that, it's, that the map is proper since you have, and there's still compact tori? There's still compact on this, you have holomorphic vector fields on that compact torus. Like on an abelian variety, okay. you have, so the abelian variety is a vector space, complex vector space by a, a lattice. No, it's just sometimes when people say torus, they may mean C stars. Yeah. Uh, I see your point. No, no, no. What I mean is when I say torus, I mean the real torus, S1 to the yeah. even dimension. Topologically, that is what we are going to see. But you're right, maybe I shouldn't mess with that. What we see is that now we have a action of the complex additive group on this, which will be effective, and this is proper, so it must be an epidemic variety. The fibers are compact. But you are right, I think I probably am missing things together, messing things together with the real case. But, uh, Okay, so you have these abelian varieties of the fibers which have themselves. So there is a real point of view too because it's, it's a hypercator, right? So you've also chosen. Right, but. Um, it's also a Yes. Yes, uh, probably. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, so the starting point is the comparison of these abelian varieties for SLN and PGLN. For GLN, if you want to know the, the varieties will be Jacobians of some so-called spectral curves. Jacobians are known to be uh, self-dual. Uh, but what we were studying is the SLN uh, Higgs moduli space. So let's see the picture. The picture is that you have the SLN Higgs moduli space, this twisted, smooth um, moduli space. You have this finite group acting on it, so you have this quotient down to this orbifold, the PGLN Higgs moduli space. And then you have the two region system here, just the SLN region system, which is a proper map down to the same base as in the PGLN case. There is this finite group acting on the fibers, so the fibers are related by a portion of a finite group. So you will see abelian varieties in two cases, which are isogenous. Uh, so one is a finite group quotient of the other. And our observation was that these are these abelian varieties generically are dual abelian varieties. And this is a non, so I mean, being dual abelian variety is a much stronger factor than being dual tori in the real sense. So that was the starting point because what you can now say, roughly, that we are in the geometrical picture suggested by Strominger, Yosaslo for the or symmetric pair of Calabio, three folds in that case, in that case. But we have these hyperkiller manifolds, which are in particular Calabio. And if you change complex structure, uh, to another one, then this um, integral, this um, this switching system will become a special Lagrangian you fiber. Really want to have an arrow on the top of this diagram? That's you don't need that, but we have it uh, because we have this way to define this as a finite group quotient of the other. I'm mentioning this because then you can see it, see nicely what's the connection between the abelian varieties. One is going to be a finite group quotient of the other which is a good sign because we know that the dual abelian varieties should be isogenous. One should be a finite group quotient of the other. But this is exactly the finite group you need to divide this abelian variety to get its dual. But you are right, you don't necessarily have it in general. This is just the peculiar case of SLM when you have it. So anyway, in the other complex structure, this, Calbi, this hyperkiller manifold becomes a Calbio manifold with respect to which these uh, completely integrable systems will become special Lagrangian vibrations with dual fibers, exactly as in the Stominger Yalzaslo proposal. So, our uh, project started by started, starting to think about this pair of hitching systems as being mirror symmetry in one way or another. So, what? Yes? So, Poincare Bondar 
on, on the product fiber was, does it extend to a... Very good question. I will come back maybe to this in the last talk. Uh, may not get that far. But indeed, that's going to be the geometrical project of trying to really see this mirror symmetry in action. Yeah, can, can you say something about the, I mean, the Poincaré boundary would be a very strong information, but can you say something about the, spe the, the bad fibers? Let, let's come back to this in the last talk. Well, you, you will be here. Um, okay, so maybe we can talk about that later. Okay, um, okay so, um, so now, yeah. Right, but that was a compact um, Calabian we have. So in this case, the base doesn't change. It's the same affine space, vector space. If you want to think of this is like a part of the sphere. But we are not going to be able to compactify these things as hyperkiller manifolds. So best to accept, and this is part of my work, so always you have to accept you are in the non-compact situation. You have to work harder to get the similar results. Because for non-compact varieties, things are more difficult to define. And, uh, so this is clearly non-compact. Okay. So now let me tell you what is the topological mirror symmetry conjecture which these lectures are going to be about. Um, so the topological mirror symmetry conjecture is really this. So now the, um, what we did with Michael in the first place, we had this um, chunk that this thing should be uh, uh, mirror symmetry, and then we wanted to find topological evidence to that. So we started to calculate the Hodge numbers of the two varieties. Uh, for SLN, there is not much of a problem. You can define nicely these Hodge numbers. But what you find is, you remember, these finite groups act on this to give, to give you this, um, this um, orbifold, and then that finite group will act non-trivially on the cohomology. So you will have to take the invariant part of the cohomology to get the cohomology of the orbifold. So clearly, the ordinary Hodge numbers of the orbifold wouldn't work. You have to somehow enhance the, the Hodge numbers of the orbifold to get any chance of an agreement. And, uh, and then um, comes the hint again, comes from physics. The physicist tells us what is the right notion of uh, Hodge numbers for an orbifold. That's this string he's referring to here. And then we started to calculate the stringy Hodge numbers of this orbifold. Now this is somewhat trickier, but you can still do that. And you still don't have an agreement on the two sides. Now things look very good, but there is some, some twisting missing, and that missing can now be explained by including something which is called the germ, an orbifold germ on the moduli space of Higgs bundles. The appearance of the germs has to do with the, this twisting operation we have here. We are having this D here. If we didn't have the twisting, we would just have the ordinary Hodge numbers, except that in the untwisted case, things will not be non sing will be singular, so the Hodge numbers are even more difficult to, to define. So what is this step? I will now give a quick definition, and we will talk more about this tomorrow. Um, so this is the stringy Hodge numbers of this orbifold twisted by this orbifold germ. And then the formula for this is like that. You will have for every element inside your finite group, you can attach what is called the twisted sector. You take the fixed points by that element uh, of the SL and X moduli space. So these are some fixed points. Uh, and actually, I forgot to have the quotient. You also have to portion by the finite group comma. So here, actually, in this side, you will have an honest orbifold, and you will take just the Hodge numbers of that orbifold. But you will do two things. You will uh, twist everything with a local system, which arises on the twisted sector via this orbifold germ. By it. So this is some well-known mechanism. And also, you have to shift the indices of the host structure. This is called a fermionic shift. Again, this is tell us that this is the right thing to do, and there is now plenty of mathematical evidence why this is the right notion for stringy Hodge numbers. So this fermionic shift is attached to the element in the finite group. It somehow comes from the character of, the, of that element acting in the normal direction of the tangent bundle to this fixed point set. It's a, it's a straightforward thing to calculate. So now, this was really what we noticed, that when n is 2 and 3, 
there was a way to understand the cohomology of these varieties explicitly, and then we worked understanding the string cohomology of the orbifold with this extra twist, you would get an exact agreement of the Hodge numbers. So this was more like an experimental discovery because we didn't know the mechanism of how, uh, how mirror symmetry should give us the same Hodge numbers. In fact, the puzzle I'm going to finish today's talk is going to be exactly this. Um, so let me then finish this because this will be the punchline in the last talk that when n is larger than 3, it has been open, this conjecture. We could do it for n is 2 and 3, because there is a more theoretical approach to understand the cohomology of the Higgs moduli spaces, basically done by 94. And since then, we still cannot do the n equals 4 case. But one of the upshots of this lecture course will be that now we can do, I can do this for n is a prime. It is going to be a theorem. But for that, a lot of things will have to happen. So let me finish uh, this talk, uh, today's talk, with a puzzle. And the puzzle, which was actually the puzzle already back then there, why are we getting the same Hodge numbers instead of any kind of mirror phenomenon as we had it in mirror symmetry? So to really illustrate this, uh, this problem, let me give you an example, a typical example of two Hodge diamonds of mirror symmetric uh, levels, your Hitchin systems, in the case when the varieties are surfaces. I have to take a parabolic rank to Higgs bundle in order to get a surface. Unfortunately, the examples I, I had were never a surface. In order to get a surface, you have to have a generalized version of the, of the mirror symmetry I mentioned so far. But in this case, for parabolic rank to Higgs bundles, probably for one parabolic point on an elliptic curve, you can show that the moduli space, uh, two Higgs moduli space is going to be a surface and that its Hodge diamond is going to be this. And then you can show that on the other side you will have this orbifold, uh, the quotient by this finite group, in this case the, by the Klein group Z2 to the 2. And this is going to be the same Hodge diamond. And they are the same, but there is no way to reflect one to the other. There is no inner symmetry, uh, well, except the CV symmetry like this. But, but we would ideally like a symmetry, something like this. And then we didn't understand that. In fact, our argument back then was, oh, note what happens for a compact hyperkilet manifolds. Then they are the same as well as symmetry. But forget about symmetry, maybe for non-compact hyperkilet manifolds, mirror symmetry only gives you agreement of Hodge numbers. But in the last talk, we will learn that, in fact, with an extra structure, we will actually see a non-trivial symmetry arising. OK, thank you very much. So the, the stringy Hodge numbers of the moduli spaces that, uh, that occurred in the conjecture, uh, are those actually Hodge numbers of a correct resolution, or is that not known? No, yes, we know that if there is a Kreppon resolution, it is a theorem now, that this is the same as the stringy Hodge numbers. Unfortunately, our examples, unless, um, um, uh, this one, the, the particular example I show here, actually will have a Kreppon resolution, I will come back to this in the last talk. But in general, you won't have a Kreppon resolution. It's known that those singularities are terminal. So unfortunately, you are absolutely right. I mean, if there was a Kreppon resolution, we could work with the smooth variety, but there isn't. So we are forced to use something which may be a little bit esoteric, but, uh, but by now, in fact, there is enough mathematical research done, so we have quite a good understanding that really they are the right watch numbers for the orbit. Is there a similar uh, mirror symmetry for the zero? Right, so of course, the, the real thing should happen when d equals zero. I mean, the, this twist is somewhat of artificial, uh, I know. But uh, the thing is, if you do the, the equals zero, you want to get a proper Hitchin map. You can, but then you have to include so called semi-stable Higgs sure. bundles. Yeah. 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 But then you will have around, for example, a trivial bundle will be there. It's a semi-stable bundle. You have a large automorphism group. It is a, going to be a very similar point in the moduli space. And we have even less clue about what are the right watch numbers of uh, these kind of stacks, more complicated stacks. We don't know what's the right Hodge number. But, so, but I have a it is still true that the generic fiber is an Alpinian variety. Right? right. And it is still true that uh, on, on what yes. you call uh, hat, right. it is also an Alpinian variety. 
In fact, what I will talk about, and I don't think I will really be talking about this, but what we can do now, we can extend from the, um, the regular locus, as we call it, to what is called the elliptic locus. Okay. Elliptic locus corresponds to spectral curves, which are integral. Even in the DNS equal D equals zero case, it's still a smooth space in the SLM case and, uh, and an orbifold case in the um, PGM case. That's exactly the setup of Engels' work, actually. And then in that case, we can prove uh, basically Engels' result is pretty much what we need to prove uh, um, mirror symmetry there. The agreement of Hodge numbers, the stringy Hodge numbers in that case, can be done, but you cannot come in. I'm interested in this complete hyperkiller manifold, which is the total space, this Hitchin system, and for that you have to include things like the Nilbot and Korn and all that, and then, then we don't know how to extend things, and as I say in the, in the D equals zero case, things are very similar there. But if you are happy enough to be on some open subset of the Hitchin base, then a lot of the things I'm talking about can be done there. 